So welcome. G. Michael Vasey here with another edition of my Magical World podcast. And today I want to share with you a really interesting and, and fascinating conversation I had with Tim Walters, who is a house healer with quite a following on YouTube. And later in the show, uh, you'll find out how to uh, find out more about Tim. And I'll also put some notes uh, associated with the podcast. We covered a, a very wide range of topics, to, much to my surprise. I had envisaged talking about dowsing, and of course we did. But uh, we ended up going off into many, many different directions and had an absolutely fascinating conversation. Please welcome Tim Walters. Thank you for inviting me, basically, Gary. It's always interesting to talk to people to get um, get their input onto this sort of thing as well. You know, I I, mean, I, I really enjoy talking to people about um, the stuff that I do and seeing how other people react to this sort of thing, um, to this, what I guess some people call the paranormal, some people call the uh, subtle energies, some people call the mystical aspects of life, because that's really what we're going to be talking about. I'm a house healer and an alternative life coach. And as a house healer, what that involves is a great degree of dousing. I work with properties to help improve the um, response of a property to the owners. So in other words, to help the, improve the well-being of a person by working on the aspect of their land, where they live, the property, the building in which they live. So it's working at a very subtle level and connecting to very many aspects of the place in which people live. And I do that remotely from here. I work, um, I'm based in the UK in the Yorkshire Dales, and I work with clients all over the world. I've got clients in Australia, clients in Canada, you know, America, um, and some in the UK. So what do I do? I use dowsing to identify aspects of a place that are detrimental for the owner and that usually comes under the heading of what people refer to as geopathic stress. And we could talk a little bit more about that later on. How I got started in all this is, of course, a long story. Here we are in 2020. Basically, up until the point of 1998, I really had very, very little thought or contact or any kind of influence uh, or inclination towards anything that was kind of spiritual or anything that was sort of maybe woo let's just call it woo woo yeah um and then in 1998 my wife and i decided we would move house we moved we were living at that point in the southeast of england in tunbridge wells in kent and we moved right across the country to the welsh borders so that we could get a property that was considerably larger than where we were living in a little two up, two down with a pocket handkerchief garden in Tunbridge Wells. We moved into a, a five bedroom Georgian townhouse in a little village um, in the Forest of Dean. And why do I tell you this? Because moving in there, <laughs> that completely changed our lives because we realised that things were not quite as they seemed uh, once we'd moved in. Things started happening in the house. We were getting the usual lights flickering, this sort of thing. And I'm trying to think about specifics that occurred. But I was starting to see shadows moving out of the corner of my eye. Um, and we were having workmen in and they were, you know, various workmen were doing work on the house. And a few of them, we noticed, were having very quiet conversations in the corner. They didn't want us to hear. <laughs> and you think, well, what, what earth are they talking about? And there was one particular room in our house, which was sort of... It had been neglected by the previous owners. The previous owners had lived there for 10 years or so. And there was this like a, a dog leg to the property that sort of was out. You had to go under the stairs, a little kind of, you know, crouchy sort of passageway and into the oldest part of the house, which had been at one part time a barn, I think. And it was two, two stories. But it was it was used as the previous owner's dumping ground i mean literally yep. to the extent that the overflows from the toilets in the main house actually were directed into this space it, so it was a literally just a dumping ground and that always felt very 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 peculiar in terms of you know, it's it was like, well, well, some people actually, my mother-in-law, funnily enough, it's not a gag, but my mother-in-law didn't used to like going into that space. She she would refuse to go in there. Um, 
again, we just we just thought, oh, well, she's being a bit peculiar, but, you know, whatever. And I always put this feeling of sort of a heaviness and oppression down to the fact that it was just a, a, an awful space, a, a storage space, a neglected space. But when, when, when I was starting to get more and more of these shadows um, out of the corner of my eye in my peripheral vision and, and things started going missing in the house, you know, I would be doing a bit of DIY, you know, using a, a chisel or, a, or whatever it would be, and I'd put it down and, and literally turn around, turn back to pick it up again, and it wasn't there, you know. Yeah. It was these sort of things that were, were like, okay, well, this is, this is a bit, this is odd, this is, this is odd. And, you know, that chisel, for example, would have reappeared in the centre of the floor a couple of days later. So, and it was really, really obvious when it was there, you know, so there was no way I could have missed it. It just literally vanished. So long and the short of it was that one of the contractors we had working in the house uh, at one point, he just quietly came up to us and said, I think you should get your house cleared. And we said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, uh, spiritually cleared. Um, I do know some people that can do that for you. And if you want, I'll get in touch with them. So we had three ladies turn up. Um, it was just their hobby. They you know, didn't charge any money for it or anything. They were part of the local spiritual group, as I later discovered there's lots of these around the country. They turned up um, and they arrived on the doorstep with these bent bits of metal in their hands, which I later learned were dowsing rods. They examined the house. They went around the house. They were asking questions of the house. Um, and basically, the long and the short of it, after about half an hour, they said, well, you've got a, a spirit of a dead lady here, and she just wants to be part of the family. Oh, and it's right. like, what? <laughs> what are you saying? And, you know, the funny thing was, Gary, that, that it was the most perfectly normal thing to happen and for them to say. And it was like, oh, yeah, well, OK, of course. Yeah. So she's been trying to get in touch with us, you know, through these things and, through, and being very present in the sort of peripheral vision and all this sort of stuff to, to basically you know, get our attention and say, hello, I'm here. Don't worry about it. Um, you know, but but just uh, acknowledge me, really. I, I want to be part of the family. Yeah. So in order to speak to uh, this um, disincarnate soul, effectively, um, uh, I, I learned dowsing because there was no way at that point that I was just going to sort of say, oh, OK, well, we've got the spirit that's deadly. Um, we know she's there. Right. Let's let her get on with whatever she does and we'll just get on with our life. Because, uh, you know, I mean, how could how could I live in a house knowing there was a spirit there or, or believing there was a spirit there? A, I wanted to verify B, I wanted to find out all about her and see what on earth is she doing there and why does she want to be there? What was it <laughs> about? You know, and the other yeah. thing was, was I going mad? You know, yeah. that was a very, very real possibility to me. The reason that I thought I might be going mad was because one of the instances that happened um, before the ladies came round was that I was in the kitchen, um, which is at the back of the house, so fairly near this sort of this room. But I was in the kitchen just making a cup of tea, just, you know, normal everyday activity. Put my hand out to pick up the mug. And I was really aware, really aware that there was an arm that had like a black sleeve on it. And it did exactly the same as my arm did. And it was about three or four inches to the right of my right arm as I reached out to pick up the mug. It just appeared from nowhere. It, was, it mimicked my action and, and then it disappeared. And I was like, oh, gosh. Hallucination. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 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 So was that, you know, with everything else, with the, with the peripheral vision action, it added up to things it's like, well, thing, you know, this is odd. Now, you jump to the hallucination and okay yeah so there is an aspect of hallucination in actually everything but let's let's come back to that in a sec but in terms of was it like tripping on drugs hallucination no it wasn't and i can you know i can say that with some certainty because when i was at college when i was a younger man that's what we were all doing so right. it, it wasn't that type of hallucination anyway all of that Basically, moving into the house in 1998 got me into dowsing and um, basically led me into a, a, a very, very different way of seeing the world. Well, it's interesting that a haunting would 
push you in the direction of dowsing because um, for, for me, I, I grew up in a similar house with a similar set of circumstances and it's scared the living daylights out of me. But it pushed me in a very different direction, which was to read all about the paranormal and then sort of wander into meditation and magic and uh, trying to control my inner self in order to reflect some peace and calm into the outer world. Right. And I wrote a book in 2005 um, where I talked about you know, when I was a, a teenager, I must have been lit up like a Christmas tree on the other side, inviting every piece right. of spiritual flotsam and jetsam to come and take a perk at me, you know. <laughs> and right. I would never have thought of dowsing, even though my father was a big time dowser. Uh, he used it even to find electrical wires and pipes around the house and things like that. He, he would use it over modern technology and swore by it. And right. so I remember even being like nine or ten, walking through a farmer's field with a pair of rods that he'd built, you know, practicing looking for water. <clears throat> so I was taught dowsing at a very early age. It would never have entered my head to use dowsing, though, in the context that you were in, which I find intriguing. Yeah, but you see, of course, because your father used it for all those practical purposes, for, yeah. you know, tracking electrical cables, finding the water pipes where they were running and all of that sort of thing. That's what you learned. You learned that those red, those, you know, the, the, the right angled rods were used for that purpose. So why yeah. would you, unless your father had been there with you saying, right, let's go and talk to these spirits that are bothering you, <laughs> you know, th and then yeah. you would have thought, hey, that's a good idea. Let me try that, you know, yeah. because that... Basically, um, the first time I saw dowsing rods were, were being held by these three ladies. It was like the three witches of Macbeth coming into the house. It was bizarre, <laughs> but, it was, but it was lovely. And so I saw dowsing rods being used to communicate with spirits. And that was the first time I'd uh, seen them or even had any kind of understanding. I hadn't even heard of uh, uh, water witching, you know, dowsing for water at that time. Yeah. So I actually thought that this is the way, this is what dowsing rods were used right. for. And okay. I thought, that, you know, for years, I mean, I'm, I'm a very uh, introverted sort of private person. I don't, you know, get out a lot. <laughs> and there are various gags that we could make up about that. Maybe I should. But it wasn't until many years later when I actually joined the British Society of Dowsers and started to meet other dowsers that I realised not everybody used dowsing in the way that I did. And what I was doing Interesting. was having, I was having conversations using dowsing with guardians of sacred sites and, uh, and as well as um, this lady that uh, we learned was called Jane. So I was talking to Jane, having conversations with Jane, using the dowsing as like a switch to turn on a sort of a mediumistic aspect of self so that I could actually have these conversations with her. And then I would go to sacred sites because this got me into um, earth energies, ley lines, the work mm -hmm. of Hamish Miller. And this is where I, how I met Hamish Miller and learned from him over the years. And I was fascinated by ancient stone circles. And yeah. one of the things with these very sacred sites is that you, you, if you approach them with a degree of uh, a sanctity and respect, and you're in the meditative sort of mindset, then you actually experience these places in a completely different way than if you just go, wander, you know, get out of the car and go wandering in and go, oh, what's this bit of granite yeah. doing here? You know, you, you, so you, you can really you can really activate those those circles or yeah. reactivate them by by treating them in a certain reverent way. And I, I completely agree. I was um, at a, a stone circle with a couple of um, buddies of mine a couple of years ago up on the Scottish border, and we did a, a, a small impromptu elemental ritual inside the circle. Right. And I tend to be a bit clairvoyant, so we're, we're just we've finished and we're just looking around, and I see this lady step out from behind one of the stones, dressed in very strange clothing, walk towards me with her arms open with a broad smile on her face. And I turned to my friend and said, oh, someone's with us. I turned yeah. back. There was no one there. But yeah. I, I took it to be the spirit of the place showing that there was pleasure in what we had done, you know. Wonderful. Yeah, perfect. You see, brilliant. You yeah. see, so somebody like you, Gary, you see, you're very, very, um, I, I, I meet a lot of people like you, which is that, 
that you're 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 sensitive you're incredibly sensitive if you've got that kind of clairvoyant ability then you're you're open to all of this subtle energy and you said before when you were younger you had these yeah. experiences now they may have been very unpleasant at that time but that's because you didn't understand what was going on and with all of this stuff where we get where we get hauntings quote unquote most often it is spirits of the deceased or aspects of reality, so personalities on the other side of the veil that are simply trying to make contact, usually because they don't understand where they are. They don't, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. And it's corny, but actually it's become corny because it's true. You know, that is the fact that there are aspects of personality existing on different vibrations and they're, they're absolutely there and they're absolutely everywhere. It's part of the nature of the reality in which we live. So there's no need to fear most of this stuff. And it's the fear in us that actually disconnects and makes the connection actually one that it can be unpleasant because the fear vibration in the self means that you're connecting to a lower form of vibration on the other side of the veil. So therefore, you're more likely to connect to a very disgruntled spirit, a very angry spirit, one that is really in need of uh, help, but they're expressing their need of help through anger and fear. And this is why we get some of the, the classic symptoms of a haunting. So as you say, if you do self-work and you continue to do self-work and work on improving your joy that you can maintain, I mean, I'm talking to you, but I'm saying this to everybody, you know, myself yeah. included, then what you do is you do literally raise that vibration. You do literally maintain a presence of joy. And what you connect to on the other side of the veil is far more loving and open and wonderful than, than some of the darker aspects. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I guess I've developed a, a theory that, uh, in fact, some of these, I, I think that some of the entities on the other side actually feed off of the fear energy and they purposefully create that fear within you in order to 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 use it um and i also as a magician a practicing magician i i, I know that i can create thought forms as well through yeah. and i think we all do just as a result of of thinking about yeah. things and really visualizing so so for example if if you're obsessed with, uh, say, you know, a particular female actress because you, you lust after her. That's a very strong emotion. Yeah. And if you're constantly lusting, then basically you are actually creating an, an, an entity that attaches itself to you. And um, yeah. it can actually take on independent life and it feeds off of your lust. It wants lust. And so it creates lust. Yeah, um, I use that as an example. It's a very good example because it's a very strong, it's a very strong energy, and those basic instincts of reproduction and the rest of it are incredibly strong. Now, you also think there's the other side to that, which is actually the subject, so the actress that's being lusted after. If she's got five, you know, half a million people putting that energy out at her image and her presence, imagine what her energy system is like. Absolutely. I know that a lot of people uh, know, know about Hamish, so I just wondered if, if you had any sort of thoughts on, on Mr. Miller and what he was about and how you interacted with him just to share with people for a couple of minutes and then return back to what you do. Yeah, no, I, 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 Hamish is, uh, oh dear, I, I just, he was, he, Hamish Miller was the most wonderful man that I have ever met. Um, that does not mean to say that he was a perfect human being. Um, and he, None of us are. <laughs> no, that's funny, though, isn't it? Um, he, he was just such a wonderfully warm-hearted man. And I've never met anybody, and I still haven't met anybody, that comes close to how warm-hearted and how compassionate he actually was and how his desire, his desire to help the human race improve which often fell on their fears, of course. Um, but he did have a real desire, and he was absolutely convinced that dowsing was a way to help people start on a spiritual path, start on a journey of exploration that, 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 that as you found, and as I found, is a journey of discovery of self and nature of reality. So Hamish was a great one for, for promoting dowsing as a way to, to, to as a self-development tool. 
he did a massive amount of work on earth energies um, and he, he obviously uh, as probably most of your listeners know he wrote um, with Paul Broadhurst he wrote the sun and the serpent uh, yeah. which was the journey of discovery of the Michael and Mary lines across the south of England the big big earth energy lines that travel along the Michael alignment and uh, these days his wife his widow should we say um, Baal Miller is patron of the uh, Mary and Michael uh, pilgrimage route, as they call it, which is a route that has actually been marked with signposts and all the rest of it across the South England, following more or less the flow that um, Hamish uh, and Paul um, established was there. And that's a terrific thing. And he didn't, he wasn't alive when that started to be established, but he would be, um, you know, he would absolutely love that as being a yeah. sort of part of the legacy of what he did, his work. I've got that book in front of me, along with a couple of others, uh, including his little book on dowsing, which is quite quite a, a beautiful little book, and uh, I, I found very useful. And I also, I think through your YouTube channel, kind of indirectly found an old documentary with him and Paul Broadhurst yes. actually retracing That's the route. And there's uh, there's amazing scenes where they're driving along talking, and he's got one rod in his hand, and suddenly goes. Shoo! <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a classic, isn't it? It really is. Yeah, I, I've never met the, the director of that, but uh, he, he did a great job, a uh, really nice job on that. And that was a that's the scene that everybody remembers. It's like Hamish driving and using a dowsing rod. It's like, yeah, don't try this at home. But, yeah. <laughs> well, that, that, that encouraged me to get out and about in Brno here in the Czech Republic and up on the castle, uh, Spielberg Castle. With, with a pair of rods, and I, I've been mapping uh, periodically, on and off, mapping these these uh, energy lines that go th around the castle, not through it, but around it, oh, okay. and trying to follow them through the city of Brno, which, you know, you have to be, you have to pick your moments because to see some guy walking down the street. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, you know, surprisingly enough, I never had any problem at all sort of tuning into the earth energy with, with the rods and, and finding these lines. And I can even now I can go out today with the rods and think, well, where, where did I find it? It was somewhere here. And I'll find it in exactly the same place. And it's not memory. I, if it is memory, it's subconscious memory because, you know, I, it's six months ago since I last did this. And so it, it's got, kind of created a, a little, um, a new hobby for me, which is uh, trying to connect with energies in the Czech Republic, which is a foreign country for me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, I, I, the whole process of dowsing is, is uh, as far as we understand it, or, the, or most likely to be driven by the subconscious. So it's the subconscious or the unconscious, whichever one you want to label it as, picking up information and then, we're, we allow it to come through into the conscious awareness, which is when it affects the dowsing rod or the pendulum. Yes. So, somebody like you who's uh, open and sensitive, yeah, you're not going to have a problem picking up this sort of stuff. Sometimes, you know, people are really interested by dowsing, but they are, they for whatever reason, they find it difficult to to actually to get the, what, well, what I would call reliable results. Now, the thing is, with, with dowsing earth energy, Dear old Hamish always in his day, uh, so well, I guess he was really most active in the 90s and then into the early 2000s. He died in 2010. He, he always said that actually, um, you know, if you, when you teach somebody to douse, don't get them onto earth energy straight away. Get them confident in their dousing by, by using real world examples. And so they've got things that they can verify. But, you yeah. know. I always found that earth energy was an easy thing to find. And I, when I was running dowsing workshops around that time, I met him in uh, 2002, I think it was. And I was running workshops then. And I was, te I was doing teaching people to douse on a Saturday morning. And by some Saturday afternoon, they were finding earth energy lines. You know, we'd go to the local sacred site. So I never found that that was a problem for people. Um, yeah. I think what's interesting is 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 what do you then do with it? You know, it's very interesting to go off dowsing and walking through. <laughs> I love the idea of yeah. walking streets. Um, it is very fascinating, and there are certain uh, structures and um, you know um, uh, what do we say formations that you will find a, a, um, uh, within all Earth energy lines, all Earth energy crossings, sacred sites, etc. 
but what do you do with it? I'm a great one for thinking, well, okay, so this is fantastic, but how do we use it? How can we use this to benefit people? And that's really why I ended up going down the route of, okay, well, we influence these energies. We influence the energy around us. Like you said earlier on in the role of magician, you can create all sorts of energy fields, good or bad. Uh, Obviously, we are working in alignment with the highest good. So we're always working with divine energies but in terms of the house healing work we're doing the same sort of thing we're we're asking upstairs the management upstairs to actually influence for the better somebody's well-being on the other side of the world and that is what we do with it earth energy plays a really fundamental role in that kind of interaction and the Mm -hmm. reason say that is from the very very basic exercise you would have seen it on my youtube channel where you find a power center the 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 strongest you know strongest spiral vortex within your own home or or you do this at a sacred site it doesn't matter Uh, if you go to a sacred site the vortex is going to be stronger it's going to be more responsive and you simply you ask to be shown that you find that and then you ask to be shown the radial radials of energy that come out of it and you can count those you walk around in a circle count those you might have half a dozen But if you then focus with compassion and send love into that space and express love, connecting to your heart, which is the aspect of all individual human beings that connects everybody, then actually, and then you douse that power center again and you count those radials again, you'll find that that half dozen has increased to maybe 10, 12. And you keep doing that and you'll get more and more radials. And what you're doing is you're changing the energy of the etheric world around you. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've seen that video and, and um, I found, uh, well, where I'm sitting uh, in front of my computer, where I spend most of my life, unfortunately, is where, where I found the biggest vortex, not surprisingly. Yeah, yeah uh, exactly. And, and in the Czech Republic, I, I'm trying to find the the same sort of thing that Hamish uh, Miller and Paul Broadhurst did, because I'm sure that, you know, exists here. And I've I started will, yeah. looking for old Templar sites and, and you know, pagan sites and Slavic uh, sites and so on and trying to figure out how they link together energy wise. And it's slow progress because you can only do this at various times of the year and at weekends and things like that. But uh, yeah. it, it's very interesting. But why am I doing it? Personal interest, really. And, and also just to just to try to bring a few people in uh, I have yeah. a friend who can't dowels, he keeps trying, he can't do it. I keep saying, you know, just be patient, it will happen. And uh, he's interested in all this stuff. And I think the more awareness we spread, that yeah. really, there's a, you know, we live in an energy environment and uh, how, how the energy is influenced by our thoughts and emotions um, yes. is very important. And the more people that become aware of this, I, I think the better. But, um, yeah. How do you do you get engaged then in in sort of leading spirits to the other side uh, at all? Yes, that kind yes, of activity. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean that's one and of the. Aspects. How do you how do you do that? You just talk to them using the dowsing rods to 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 to, to basically format the communication. Yes, exactly. Yes, I mean the the uh, as part of the house healing, the house healing that we do is structured around uh, maybe 50 or so section headings. Ghost spirits, trapped souls is one section heading. So we will often find that there are uh, entities, well, no, it's not not called them entities. There are personalities that need to be helped across the veil if they've got lost, if they've got confused and all that sort of stuff. So once we've done the dousing of all of the aspects, all of these 50 section headings, including the ghost spirits, trapped souls, We'll sit in a meditative state, and that's when we ask and we connect to the management. So we're always connecting to the management upstairs and asking them to assist what is required. So for a trapped soul, so for somebody that is lost on the other side of the veil and hasn't continued their journey into the light, if we want to use these expressions, then we are simply asking the management to open the portal for that aspect of personality or that aspect of reality. And... Uh, assist that aspect to go through into the light. And now, if you're a sensitive or even just somebody that has um, a good visual comprehension within within the inner universe, then you'll soon start to both see and or feel things shift as you sit in meditation and connect to the management and do this sort of process. So it's a very straightforward 
thing. Most of the time, most of these souls know what's going on. They are grateful in terms of saying, okay, yeah, great, I'm through. Sometimes you get some that are a bit stubborn. Sometimes they, <laughs> they want to hang around for whatever reason they, they have. But most of the time, that sort of, so in other words, energies that we're dealing with that have been people uh, have been alive, they've been incarnate, they are quite willing to go on through. We find quite a lot of uh, shamanic, you know, wise men, wise women, uh, also sometimes tr stuck uh, for whatever reason. And sometimes they're less willing to go because they feel as though they've got an obligation for doing stuff there in that murk that they find themselves. But actually, yeah. You know, I, we just have a conversation with them. It's like, really, you want to stay there? Why do you want to do that? You know, because actually, you know this stuff. If you step on through, you're continuing your journey, you're evolving. That's got to be a better option for you than staying here. You know, appreciate all yeah. the and before, but move on. And usually after that sort of conversation, they will they will um, move on. And uh, usually they turn and acknowledge you, but others just sort of go without... Um, really a, a sort of a, a big acknowledgement but we don't do the work for that acknowledgement anyway it's just a process of um really what we're looking for is if we're working for a client we're, we're looking for a change and an improvement in the well-being of the client so it doesn't really matter what we encounter and you mentioned thought forms and life forms earlier on and yeah people are creating those all the time now those can be a bit trickier they're not quite as straightforward as just a disincarnate soul that has got lost those can be All trickier. Right. As you said, they're more parasitic. Yes. So, you know, a parasite wants to live. It wants to optimise its environment to survive and grow. That's its purpose. So when you've got a thought form, they're not too difficult. But if it's evolved, if it has so much energy poured into it that it actually has almost a sentience of its own and is detached from your energy field or a person's energy field, then it yeah. will wander around a space and it will do whatever it can to survive. So it will hide, Absolutely. it will be deceptive, it will do all of these things that we recognise as being unhelpful. So those are a little bit trickier to get rid of, but they can be got rid of. Um, so yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating work, of course. Have you come across anything, you know, really um, negative and, and not, not human, but you know, demonic, I suppose, would be the expression? Well, it's all labels, isn't it, really? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the key, uh, again, the key, as, as, as you uh, already have found, is that the key is that there's no point in trying to do this work if you go into these spaces and uh, ha have fear with you about doing it. That's the worst possible situation. So there are things that come out and threaten uh, as, as sometimes, as you know, as I'm doing the house healing, sometimes there are, you know, massive uh, sort of. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to use the word demonic because most of the experiences that I've had have not been in that that um, level of right. What we call real evil. I mean, there are little demons, and they're just they're just poxy. They're just they're useless. They flap around and get in the way, so they <laughs> get disposed of very quickly. These are just sort of you know classic little demon things. Those are yeah. pretty useless but a, a, a really intense evil presence i i haven't personally encountered as yet and uh, that's not to say that there isn't um what was really interesting and i had a really interesting experience actually while i was still um because for a living you, you you'll know this but for a living i used to make video programs corporate video programs for businesses and run conferences and this sort of thing yeah. and at the end of doing that work I got a job that was to go and do a recce um, for a potential broadcast uh, program uh, that was looking at the way that the Germans, I can't remember what, it was in Prague, it was just outside Prague. In the Second World uh -huh. War, the Germans had absolutely annihilated a village uh, in retaliation. Yes, yes, yes. I've been there, I've been there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, it's actually a beautiful place now, but it's a memorial. Yeah, I know, it was in retaliation for the assassination of one of the senior SS officers or Gestapo or something, I think it was. And I was I was a bit fearful of going there. I wasn't very happy about uh, doing this recce. Uh, you know, I put in loads of protection and asked upstairs for lots of protection. But what was amazing, what I'm trying to get to, was that as the group of us on this recce walked, we stepped into 
the space that was delineated by the remaining sort of single layer of bricks that had been the schoolhouse, right? Mm -hmm. we stepped up into this space, all of us sort of gathering rather loosely together. But what I became aware of was that I could actually see a beautiful white dome around us, all of us as the group. And around the edges of that dome, on the outside, was all this dark, swirling mass of fog-type mm. shit, basically. Excuse the expression, but that's the only way to put it. And that was literally a visual, visualized, a visual representation of the protection that we were being held in. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't, wasn't like a predatory... Excuse the cat in the background. He's not well, <laughs> if you can hear that. But it wasn't like a predatory evil presence, but it was a swirling darkness that... Chaos, chaotic yeah. sort of energy. Chaotic yeah. and, yeah, and very, very sinister in... Yeah. Because it, because that's what happened there. It was absolutely, you know, annihilation of a village is not a nice thing. If I remember yeah. rightly, it's very it's very close to the, the, um, the, the country residence of the Czech president, and there's a very nice park there just that's outside right. of the... Yeah, so I've definitely been there, and I, I deliberately didn't uh, go into that part of the village because I, um, well, I, yeah. I knew I would feel something, and I wasn't in a good mood that day. So, no, well, yeah, exactly, and that's probably that's probably sort of tied tied to where you were going anyway, Gary. To be honest, if you were in that sort of un, unpleasant mood, you know, yeah. it's all it's all linked. I mean. Yeah, it's all linked, but that's another, you know, we'd spend an hour just talking about the way that reality manifests itself. Well, it's funny because just a couple of days ago, I read in a Czech uh, magazine translated by Google, because I'm not that good um, yeah. at Czech, but I read that um, they were picking up on some new new scientific theory that the past, present and future all exist in, in one moment and that basically, we're, you know, we're living parallel with the past and the future. And there isn't really a past or a future. It's all going on all at the same time in a single instant. Yeah. And uh, I thought, well, that's that's really interesting because quantum quantum mechanics, quantum physics, which is confusing. But if you yes. really drill into some of that stuff, uh, it does. It, it's almost as if science has finally caught up with esoteric knowledge to some extent. <laughs> because exactly. I've I've always been convinced that that's the case. You know, that that everything's happening at the same moment. Just That's by exactly. sort of sensing, yeah. Yes, exactly right. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, there's there's so much work being done on the boundaries and exploration of human consciousness, and the nature of reality, and how is it built? Because if you think about it, quantum mechanics started to come to the fore over 100 years ago. It's almost 120 years ago now. And so the amount of scientific research that has gone on, you know, I mean, the, half of the technology that we use these days is built upon uh, quantum entanglement. You know, quantum yes. entanglement is used in, in the security features of mobile phones. We've got to a stage where even uh, on, a, on, a, on a practical level, it is not unusual now for science, science, I mean, it's a general term, scientists, but for people that are constructing things to be working with one layer of atoms in order to construct things, which is an extraordinary development. So our yeah. understanding of the quantum world is is massive. It's, it's coming on leaps and bounds every year. And there's an absolutely fascinating book by a guy called Donald Hoffman. And the book is called The Case Against Reality. He is a neuroscientist, and he is basically explaining in that book how our reality absolutely could be an illusory environment, that, and we are just simply processing information, and that the real world, whatever that be, because it gets a little bit into sort of the world of the Matrix films, but the real world behind the illusion that we create is completely different, and we are fundamentally quantum beings and that's exactly ties in with the with the spiritual beliefs of yes. most most um, uh, traditional spiritual practices. When I first saw the movie The Matrix, it, I, I was shocked because in in some of my books I've I've related this uh, experience. When I was maybe five or six, a little boy, around about the time I started infant school in in Yorkshire, I remember sitting in, in the living room and having this thought that I wasn't really there. Instead, I was in a little room plugged up to a machine 
And I was living my life through this machine. Well, I didn't know it was called artificial intelligence or anything because there's no such, I don't think there was such terminology perhaps back then. And anyway, I was too young. Yeah. But when I saw The Matrix, I, I almost, you know, fainted because that, that scene where he wakes up, you know, and he's all plugged in. Yeah. It just reminded me of that little, little, and I never forgot this, uh, this sort of little sort of waking when, dream type thing. Yeah. You know? when, man, absolutely. It's excellent. I mean, it really is excellent. It's, I mean, it's excellent that you got that memory and you had that experience. It's also what I love is that a movie like The Matrix connects it. The, pen, the penny drops for so many people. And yeah. uh, I mean, I know, bless him, David Icke used The Matrix as an analogy and uh, for, for a lot of his books. But it works as an analogy. It works. And yeah. we've got people like Greg Braden now. I don't know whether you're familiar with his work. Um, he's a no. very, very good um, communicator. He, he comes from a, well, he calls himself a scientist. I think he's actually a geolo geologist, um, which is uh, fair enough. I shouldn't, shouldn't denigrate the role of a No, you shouldn't be, because you're talking <laughs> to a PhD geologist. Oh, well, there you go, Gary. How can I know? <laughs> <laughs> of course he's a scientist. Um, so, so Greg Braden is a brilliant communicator. And what he's done is a massive amount of research into ancient uh, civilizations and this sort of thing. And now, um, and it's relating it all to spirituality and to our current point in history, et cetera, et cetera, and our current awareness, the role of our reality. But now he more or less readily adopts the fact, the fact, he uses it as fact that actually we're living in a simulation and um, and therefore that is his background scenario to which everything he he talks about these days is is basically hanging off that and that actually is is, is quite a good um, way to look at reality from my point of view it's a nice way to look at it because actually it means that if it's a simulation and you can you can term it as a simulation in whatever you know give it give it whatever character you want it to be this simulation it doesn't matter how you think it's being created but if it's being created and it's therefore what we call a simulation it means somebody with a personality and an aspect has created it which means yeah. somebody is in charge of it. it 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 can't which is why Hamish is <laughs> A reference of the management sort of sits really well for me in terms of um, oh okay yeah the management are in charge of the simulation and we're actually part of the management anyway because we're in the simulation we've I still think that all the spiritual aspects of we make agreements about what we're going to cover when we come into this simulation for this experience of this lifetime we agree yeah. to what we're going to do uh, I think all of those things that are in all the ancient spiritual teachings, they still hold true, even if you put the label of simulation across our current experience of reality. That's fine. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, I think it's great. Yeah. And that's really nice to hear that you have that uh, experience. Yeah, and I call the management the powers that be. I think it's the same sort. Of, well, the, the group so, of people I, I sort of do stuff, we call it the powers that be, you know, whatever the yeah. powers that be want. <laughs> yeah. Them upstairs, you know, it's all of that, isn't it? Yeah. The uh, my website is www.knightsrose.com. That's K-N-I-G-H-T-S-R-O-S-E.com. So knights in armour and the thing that grows in the garden, knightsrose.com. Uh, or uh, search for me, Tim Walter, house healer, Tim Walter Dowser, on YouTube. Um, if you just put in Tim Walter, you won't find me. You'll find a German footballer which is completely different kettle of fish. And there you have it. Wasn't that fun? I really enjoyed the conversation and uh, definitely Tim. I will ask Tim to be on the show again uh, in the future because I think there was an awful lot more we could have discussed and I would like to have picked his brains an awful lot more about some of the things that he does in terms of house healing. You can learn more about him, as he said, at knightsrose.com, K-N-I-G-H-T-R-O-S-E.com. Or look for him on YouTube. He has an, a really good YouTube channel and I subscribe to it. I recommend that you do too. And I listen in to his, his, um, his YouTube videos uh, very, very often. So thank you for joining us. Please do share this uh, podcast, like it, uh, perhaps share it with friends, recommend it to others. That's the way that uh, we grow the audience. Once again, thank you to Tim. Thank you to you for listening. Hope you learned something from this podcast. Do join us with the next edition 
uh, in a couple of weeks or so. Thank you very much, and bye.